I have to say I'm very impressed that all of you showed up here tonight, given that there also is a, an event with Michelle Alexander tonight in Harlem. Uh, if you didn't know about that, please don't run out of here. <laughs> Trust me, Jean is, is, is an incredible, incredible person and scholar and fighter for her students, something that I'm gonna ask her about later on in the, in the discussion. Uh, and also Black Panther is now, uh, is now out and uh, almost every friend of mine is at Black Panther tonight, so yeah. nobody spoil it in the Q&A if you've already seen it. Um, you know, we're, we're here in this moment, Gene, where we have so many overt racists uh, in positions of extraordinary power. Uh, I, I, I think of Jeff Sessions, who is the Attorney General as of this moment, and he, uh, of course, is known for having, uh, according to his colleagues, used the N-word repeatedly, uh, joked, they say, although I, I, I'm not sure that one jokes about wanting to join the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, more recently, he went off of the prepared remarks uh, that re the Justice Department released when he was speaking in front of this National Sheriff's Association, and he inserted uh, intentionally uh, the idea of the Anglo heritage uh, attached to the history of law enforcement and people are saying, oh, well, you have to understand that this is something historical that, that he was referring to. We, we knew what he was doing, you know. It's also was historical to talk about three-fifths of people, but, you know, it's, it's, it's the, to me it's the same kind of issue. The first question I have for you is how much changes as a result of overt racists who don't pretend or spend much time trying to cover up that that's how they see this country and large portions of people in this country versus a sort of uh, softer face of, of, uh, of, of racism where uh, it's uncouth to say certain things out in public that the Stephen Millers of the world would. Um, thank you, and just to echo what Jeremy said, like this audience is extraordinary. Uh, when I realized that Blank Panther was opening tonight, I was like, oh well. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but just, it's so nice. I live in Brooklyn, I teach in Brooklyn, um, and like I'm so happy to be doing this in Brooklyn. Um, so thank you for coming out tonight, and thank you to the Brooklyn Historical Society for having us, because this is really um, amazing. So I guess I could answer that in two ways. Um, for, I had a huge kind of, uh, what would we call it, kind of crisis of faith about a year ago about the book, um, right after Donald Trump was elected, um, because the book is very much taking on um, the blinders of liberalism. Um, and if, for people who have started to open the book, um, there's a chapter on polite racism where I, I really grapple with how central polite racism was to the maintenance of racial injustice um, in the United States, in both the North and the South, and the ways that we've kind of Hit, you know, we've kind of obscured that and kind of focused on the kind of image of Bull Connor or, you know, in Hollywood, kind of if we think about that movie, The Help, right? Like the villain there was this woman who was wanting to make a bathroom outside for her maid and she was mean to her kids, right? This kind of mean, often violent, often spitting sort of image of racism. Um, and I think... So I, I had a question last year, and I was like, is this, do we need this book now, and is this what I should be spending my time on? And I was sort of ha kind of midway through it, but I had a lot more to go. And, but then it seems to me that part of what, um, sometimes I feel like a focus on the overt face cleanses so much other, um, so many other practices. Um, and I felt that way in terms of what happened in Charlottesville this year, that so many people were like, well, I would never like yell and spit and carry tiki torches and like beat up protesters as if that is the only way to stand, um, you know, to stand in the way of a, of a kind of movement for justice. Um, and so I guess where I got to with this book was the need for us to, that, that too much of how, e evil or injustice has been maintained in this country is by people saying, I am not that, 
right? How New York maintains a segregated school system is often by saying we are not the South. How Boston, how LA, if you look at school officials in all these places in the 50s and 60s, they're all saying we're not the South, we're not that. Um, and so it seemed to me to be able to have a kind of honest conversation about where we are and where we need to go. Um, the problem of, we need to sort of take on Sessions, we need to take on Trump, we need to take on um, kind of what is dumbfoundingly overt. Uh, but I think we also need to be wary that that gets a, that there's a way that people then can use that to sort of make themselves feel good or better or like, well, we've, we're fine over here, even as we're opposing rezoning here in New York City or even as we're, um, you know, the surveillance of Martin Luther King was wrong, right? But the surveillance of sort of Muslim students, that might be necessary, right? And so I think, so I guess what I'm, I, I guess there's a danger in kind of focusing so much on the horrifying and we miss the, the polite and the mundane and the bureaucratic. I mean, it, re it reminds me, and also, uh, before your book came out, you and I had, had a, a, an extensive conversation about the, the research and, and the work that you put into this. Um, but in rereading the, uh, the, the book ahead of this, I couldn't help but think of, uh, of Malcolm X's description of the sort of Dixiecrats, you know, who, who really weren't pretending uh, to be anything other than what they were, and how he sort of would prefer dealing with them as, uh, as an opponent, because at least you know where they stand, versus the people that say, oh yeah, we want you to have these rights, we want you to have the, the full right to vote, we want there to be uh, desegregation, uh, but don't mean any of it, or have an ulterior motive that, that part of it may uh, coincide with their own agenda. Mm -hmm. And do, do you see any parallels to that analysis of Malcolm X in the current context with Trump and his camp on the one hand, and then the kind of uh, mainstream of the Democratic Party's leadership when it comes to how racist policies uh, are presented, but also how they impact people. Right, right. I mean, I think a question of urgency, right? What is urgent in this moment and, and what issues sort of merit urgency? And I mean, I think the, the corollary to Malcolm X, right, is uh, Martin Luther King's that beautiful passage in Letter from a Birmingham Jail where he's saying, you know, it, the greatest threat may not be the Klan, it may be the white moderate who prefers order to justice, um, who says, I agree with your goals, but not with the methods. And I think we see a lot of that, and we've seen a lot of that around Black Lives Matter, right? So we have lots of people who say they're on board with the, the, the goals or the ideas of Black Lives Matter, but a lot of criticism of the tactics, of the disruption, of the, it's too leaderless, it's too unfocused, it's too focused, right? I mean, there's been an, uh, you know, a cacophony of, of criticism, and a lot of that criticism is not coming from you know, Trump supporters, it's coming from, you know, again, in the, in the words of, of King, the moderate or the liberal, um, who, and I think there's a, I think there's also a danger there because, and one of, the, one of the places I start the book is the way that the civil rights movement is often invoked in those conversations as the right way to do it. So the kind of be more like Martin Luther King or why aren't you like the civil rights movement? You're, you're too extreme, you're too disruptive. Um, that crazy moment two years ago, which we've talked about before, um, where Mayor Kasim Reed, the then mayor of Atlanta, um, he's celebrating, it's the home of Martin Luther King, and they believe in free speech in Atlanta, but, you know, he, explaining the huge police presence at these demonstrations around um, protests against the police killing of Philando Castile and Alton Sterling, he says Dr. King would never take a freeway. And so I think beginning with kind of the ways the civil rights movement is used to chastise Black Lives Matter, I think, often by people who profess allegiance to its goals or profess allegiance to the fight against injustice, um, I think we have to talk about that because I think there's a, there's a way that I think the invoking of the civil rights movement makes people feel like, oh, I would be with that kind of movement. If Martin Luther King was leading this, I would be with this. But just these people are too reckless, they're too loud, they wear their pants sagging, they're too uncontrolled. 
Um, and then I think when you look deeper into the history of the civil rights movement, these are the same kinds of criticisms being waged, not just against the Panthers and Malcolm X, but against people like Dr. King, right? And so, um, so I think we have to, I think there is a huge, I guess, need for kind of looking at that. And I think it's hard to know how to do that in the midst of what feels like just fires everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And it just seems like it can't get worse and then it gets worse. And so I, I think it's hard because the exceptional is so uh, mesmerizing in this moment, right? And they, they, the Trump administration continues to do things that seem you can't believe they would do it, and then it gets worse and worse. But I think there's a danger there in terms of kind of not also looking at ourselves and kind of um, the assumptions we make about what, what, what struggle looks like and what movements look like. Talk about uh, the role or, or the way that uh, various moments in the civil rights movement and figures were covered in the media at the time. This is one of the most fascinating p parts of your narrative, I think. Um, you know, I, I was recently watching uh, footage of Martin Luther King when he was on Meet the Press. And I, I was moved to go back and look at it because Meet the Press had played a clip of him on there and were sort of saying, like, look, we had Martin Luther King on this show. But if you watch the interviews, it was a very hostile panel Absolutely. of white journalists just basically trying to discredit him or undermine him or right. portray him as a, a, a crazed extremist. Right, right. And I think this is another um, what a, aspect of the myth, right? The, the media in our kind of imagination of the civil rights movement is one of the heroes. And there's a slice of it, and, and civil rights leaders like John Lewis give the media a ton of credit, right? They say like the movement would have been a bird without wings without the media's role in the Southern struggle. Um, but I think that's blinded us to sort of all the other ways that the media portrayed the civil rights movement, both in the South, but, you know, long before 1955, long after 1965, and the ways that the media is covering the struggle in its own backyard versus how it's covering, for instance, Birmingham by 1963. Um, so one of, the, one of the things I talk about in the book, right, is New York. And since um, it just seems like we should talk a little about New York tonight, and um, after Brown versus Board of Education, um, black activists, uh, white allies, sort of see this as a challenge for New York City. New York City, on the other hand, loves the Brown decision, but does not necessarily think it applies to them. They love the decision. And they think, they say, well, you know what I think we need? We need a committee to, to see if there's anything we need to do. And so they appoint this committee. And Kenneth Clark and Ella Baker, right, two people we tend to associate with the Southern struggle, are right here in New York. And they're, they're fussing about how this actually does apply to New York. And so they put Clark and Baker on this committee to try to quiet them down. Um, and lo and behold, the committee finds that, yes, uh, things like school zoning and teacher placement and teacher hiring are infected with sort of segregation and inequality and that these things need to change. And the Board of Ed ignores that. And parents protest and parents keep their kids out of school. And so there's a long movement kind of in the decade from 54 to 64. And by 1964, they've tried all sorts of things. Um, they've tried trying to get into PTAs. They've tried to make separate black PTAs. They've, again, held various kinds of sort of street protests. And so they decide in February of 1964 to call for a one-day boycott of New York City schools. Um, and nearly a half a million students and teachers stay out. Now, what does the New York Times say? It's unreasonable, it's unjustified, it's reckless, and it's violent. We're 10 years after Brown. There's nothing unjustified about asking New York City for a comprehensive plan for desegregation 10 years after Brown. Um, interestingly, I think the language of violence is revealing. And it's revealing, I think, and useful to us today because here we have a disruptive protest that has no, it's not talking about hurting property. It's not talking about hurting persons. But the New York Times calls it violent because it's meant to be disruptive. Um, and even after this massive number of people um, stay out, they still think this is not the right way to go about it. Now, meanwhile, a month later, 
um, white parents are getting nervous. This is this was massive, um, and the Board of Ed has put its toe into kind of a very modest school pairing program, a, a couple dozen elementary schools being paired. And so 15,000 white parents, mostly white mothers, march over the Brooklyn Bridge. So 15,000, almost a half a million. But the media is completely obsessed with these white mothers because, A, they're using the tactics of the civil rights movement to protest. And they're, they're protesting for their neighborhood schools and they don't want busing. And we're in the kind of the moment where television news is kind of taking off and the television news is obsessed with this story. And so this story is playing as kind of a backdrop as the Civil Rights Act is being debated. And many of the northern and western sponsors of the Civil Rights Act realize, right, that they need to make sure that the provisions that they're putting into the Civil Rights Act, particularly around school desegregation, don't come home. And so there's a loophole that they insert to make sure that sort of desegregation shall not mean um, assigning students to sort of change racially imbalanced schools. That's the word. That, ten, they, that tends to be used for northern schools. Um, so inserted in the Civil Rights Act, in part because white parents are protesting and in part because the media is obsessed with these white parents protesting, right? these congressmen that we tend to see as the sort of heroes of the story in terms of the Civil Rights Act actually put in a back door to protect their own schools. Um, and I think you can't understand that without sort of seeing both the role of the media in discrediting and sort of delegitimizing black protest and overcovering white protest, which again we can see today. I mean, these sorts of tendencies are not unfamiliar to us today. Well, and of course, the, the current uh, Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, um, is uh, a billionaire. Her uh, husband, Dick DeVos, uh, was the heir to the Amway Corporation fortune, and they own the Orlando Magic basketball team. And, and their two families, also Betsy DeVos's uh, brother is Eric Prince, the owner of the Blackwater Mercenary Company. Uh, I, I don't know if a lot of you know, so her, her idea was let's privatize uh, uh, schools and all functions around education, and his was let's privatize all U.S. warfare. But this is all the same family, and they were major Trump donors. But uh, Betsy DeVos, when she was named Education Secretary, and I still find it unfathomable uh, <laughs> to, to imagine her getting confirmed by senators, but it happened, uh, including some Democrats, which, which uh, that's a whole other conversation. Uh, but she had never set foot in a public school before becoming the it's Education just... Secretary, and on the other hand, has spent much of her uh, public life uh, railing against public schools and trying to take public monies and redirect them to the private sector. Right. The same trend you're talking about, the same essential battle, what those 15,000 you know, white mothers are marching for, isn't it the same ex exact phenomenon that's at play today with the discussion around privatizing school and uh, schools and cynically naming charter schools after, you know, Third Malcolm Marshall, X and, right, exactly. and, and Nelson Mandela. Um, right. I mean, is it the same battle in your view or the same core racial and economic issues that were at play there? And I think, I mean, I think there's some key, key similarities also in the way that people um, want to cloak it, right? So, Right. One of the big mythologies that sort of has separated the way we think about northern schools from southern schools, right, is this idea of busing. Um, and, and I think, you know, so that somehow it was much more complicated and harder and more impossible in the north because parents, it wasn't that they were against desegregation, it was they were against busing and they wanted their neighborhood schools. And then, going back to our going back to the media for a second, the media t takes it up hook, line, and sinker. They don't say all of your kids are being bused already. They don't say your kids aren't going to neighborhood schools already. Um, so they kind of immunize that language. And I think we see a similar thing. To me, it's partly about the privatization, but it's partly about the ways that these rezoning battles here in New York City have gotten covered. Mm -hmm. um, and well, the there's also the racism of how home loans uh, were right. and continue to be right. Right. Uh, given or not given. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those, you know, it's not just, oh, well, you know, if they live here, they can go to school. There's a reason why, uh, why these communities were the way that they were that wasn't just about 
uh, surface racism. It was, it was institutional economic racism as well that was contributing to this. Right, right. But similar then and now, you don't see very much space being given to, to sort of black and Latino organizing, whether it's you know, in the Dumbo school district that got all that attention or whether the Upper West Side, right? There's a lot of, of black and Latino and immigrant parent organizing, but when they cover these rezoning battles, it's like there's no, they don't feel like they have to, and this is similar to what I see looking at the ways that the media covered battles in New York City 50 years ago, that there's a kind of undercovering of sort of protest and organizing and doing things through the respectable channels, right? Mm. Um, there's always this idea that like people just get all crazy and they rise up and then why don't they go through the right channels? And then it's like, well, you, they've been going through the right channels for years and you, you, I mean, you couldn't even bother to, you know, write more than like two paragraphs on it. Um, and so I think, I think the privatization and the ways that privatization is cloaked in helping, right? So it's, I mean, some of the most cynical, right, is that is this kind of like, we, we don't like how segregated our, this city is, and so the solution is charter schools. Mm -hmm. um, and Natalie Rooks just wrote this brilliant book called Cutting School that's about the history of profiting from segregation and kind of looks at it both historically and to today, right? So, but one of the cynical things that, like aspects that she points out um, in that book is how often the kind of desire for better, equal, excellent schools gets used by people to then say, okay, we're gonna come and bring this model and it is gonna require extra money or it is gonna require taking money into the private sphere, but it's gonna give you, and then this constant like, you know, dangled possibility of equality and, and kind of knowledge that our present is so unequal is used to then make people rich. Mm -hmm. Uh, to, to move from trying to extract some uh, present day analysis from your historical scholarship, I, uh, I, I want to start off a sort of uh, deeper conversation about uh, this, this book with uh, giving you an opportunity to uh, tell people things that they didn't know uh, about the story of who Martin Luther King was, uh, what inspired him, and, but also the, the full spectrum of his views, uh, uh, not just on questions of race, but on questions of economics and militarism and the connection between uh, the, the racism and apartheid type situation in the United States and what the US was abroad. Because I would imagine even those of us who think we know parts of this story, I, every time I listen to you, and certainly in reading this, I learn new things. And I, I think it's so valuable to have this kind of scholarship done because of how often King is used right. by Democrats, Republicans, uh, Dodge Ram. You know? And I know there's complexities about how the King estate is, and it's a whole scandalous thing, but my God, watching Martin Luther King in a Dodge Ram commercial with soldiers, soldiers going off to and, war and the yeah. Marines getting, I mean, it was really sickening. Um, but, but talk about some of the unknown or lesser told uh, stories of King? I mean, this is going to be my theme tonight, but I mean, <laughs> I want to think about King here in New York. Um, and I think that um, one of the things that I think many of us now talk about King in 67 and 68, right? The, the radical King, the, Viet, the King against Vietnam, the King, the Poor People's Campaign King. Um, but I think one of, the, one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is to say that King is here much earlier um, and that king is speaking to northern liberals and calling out kind of northern liberalism from the early 60s. Um, I think one of the mythologies of King is that he somehow discovers the North after Watts, right? Yeah. right? Like all of a sudden, Dr. King is surprised. What could possibly have happened? You know, we just signed the Voting Rights Act and then these people in Watts are rising up. Um, when you actually look, at Dr. King's work and what Dr. King is doing in the early 60s, one of the things he's doing in the early 60s um, is he's traveling around a lot and he's hooking up with movements and people all over the country, including in Los Angeles. And King comes to Los Angeles multiple times in the early 60s, and it's not just to raise money for Birmingham. Uh, he actually comes right after he gets out of jail in Birmingham. But what's he talking about? He's talking about police brutality because he knows and people have been organizing 
1962, right, Ronald Stokes, the secretary of the local Nation of Islam Mosque is killed by police. A number of other members of the nation are wounded. This causes a, a kind of broad united front movement in LA. They're, they're talking about a pattern of police brutality. They're talking about the need to fire Chief Parker. These are not unknown um, demands. And King is talking about police brutality too in 1963. Um, he comes back in 1964. In 1964, um, finally in 1963, in LA, and it, so not just LA, in California, activists had worked and fought to get a fair housing bill um, to prevent discrimination in the sale and rental of property. And they finally managed to get that law passed, the Rumford Housing Act of 1963, almost immediately. Um, citizen, white citizens, and, and kind of realtors and kind of conservative politicians get a proposition on the ballot in 1964 um, to repeal that law. Um, and Dr. King comes to LA multiple times to sort of campaign against Prop 14. He's calling it one of the most significant developments in like if this passes um, and devastating developments of the 20th century. Um, as many, as you may know, that November, Californians overwhelmingly send Lyndon Johnson to the White House and they overwhelmingly approve Prop 14. Three out of four white voters in California vote yes on Prop 14, vote yes on their right to discriminate in the sale and rental of their properties. As King put it, they voted for ghettos. Um, so eight months later, um, uh, when Watts erupts, um, King is calling to count the surprise and the shock that many public officials, many sort of Californians are professing and basically saying, you know, I've come to see, I've traveled all around the North, I've been welcomed onto your podiums, um, and yet the minute that the talk turns to look, you know, I've, the, the, the actions of Southern black people are praised, you praise us, but the minute we start to talk about local conditions, only the language is polite. The resistance is firm and stubborn. Um, and in that, comment, both he's sort of calling to count these Californian officials who didn't do anything for years, these grievances were there for years, there were movements there for years. Um, also in that comment, I, I, I see this, this when he, he says, I sit on your, uh, you know, your diocese and you are in your regalia, and I recently discovered that Martin Luther King came and gave the commencement speech at City College in 1963. Um, and uh, one of my grad students to hear about is disc found this, but interestingly, only 30 black people graduate from City College in 1963. So when King speaks to this audience of 15,000 people in Harlem, it is basically an all white audience. Um, and they're, you know, and the president of City College is, uh, you know, very proud of himself for having invited King, and it happens to come when it, right after Medgar Evers is assassinated, so there's a lot of talk about the South and how horrible it is, but when I hear King say, you, you, I sit on your diocese and you're dressed in all their regalia because he's in a gown, and you know, you can imagine, right, the absurdity, right, of being in Harlem in 1963 at City College and only 30 black people are graduating from City College, right? So, so King is speaking about this, he's thinking about this, he's calling, I mean, as early as 1960, he's calling for a liberalism that's as liberal, right, that not just liberal about the South, but liberal about the North. And so I think if there's one thing tonight that I hope people go away with, it is that King is calling to count Northern liberals. And I think we've erased that. Um, even those of us who have put back into the story King's outrage against Vietnam or King's economic justice, that he is, when he's talking about the white moderate, he's not just talking about Southerners, he's talking about kind of his northern liberal allies. You know, what one, um, uh, I guess, mis uh, misimpression that I ha long had until I read your book, I, I always uh, was under the understanding that, uh, that, that King's popularity ratings uh, plummeted as a result of him uh, starting to unite race, class, and, uh, and opposition and to military. war. Uh, 
but that's totally not true. Uh, or, or I mean, maybe there was some right. He gets more some unpopular. contribution. <laughs> right. He gets more unpopular. But you, but you've you've sort of. Uh, painted yeah. a very different picture of that arc. And I think a lot of people, particularly white liberals who are trying to read this history of King, uh, maybe looking for some meaning to their own identity or sort of want to put that, that as the breaking point. But, it, but according to your book, it wasn't. Yeah. So can no. you explain what, like how was King actually covered in the New York Times? Right. And what contributed to uh, uh, the low levels of popularity that seemed to be there, but we don't even talk about today. Right. I mean, to first off, right, the civil rights movement as it's happening is not popular at the time. Now, that's not to say that lots of people didn't admire it, lots of white yeah. people, uh, black people, other people of color. So there were certainly lots of people moved by it, but the majority of Americans were not. So Gallup polls in 1961, you know, only about a quarter of Americans think that the sit-ins and freedom rides um, are, you know, are appropriate. A majority of Americans think that the 1963 March on Washington is wrong. Um, lest we see this as a problem just of Southerners, the New York Times polls New Yorkers in 1964. This is a year before the Voting Rights Act. A majority of New Yorkers don't approve of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, so certainly King's popularity, sort of by 66, three quarters of Americans do not, this is 66, this is even before yep. the public uh, kind of coming out publicly against Vietnam, three quarters of Americans don't approve of um, his tactics. I mean, I think, you know, Gary Young talks about this with, in terms of Nelson Mandela, right? That there's a kind of, people hate Nelson Mandela until he makes a reality undeniable and then people sort of change, they, they sort of you know, airbrush their own discomfort, they airbrush their own hatreds, they airbrush their own sort of uncomfortableness. And I think we forget that one of, one of the key things that Dr. King believed in was the importance of being, of, of kind of making people uncomfortable, right, of bringing tension to the surface. And people would constantly criticize him for it and say he was causing the problems and he was causing the rifts. And he would say over and over and over and over, no, this is here. We are just bringing it to the surface. It's like a boil to obviously heal it. But I think we forget that, um, that aspect of it and how controversial it is, even among people who agree with him. Just one more example. We can go back to 55 with the Montgomery bus boycott. When the Montgomery bus boycott starts, the NAACP keeps a distance from it because they don't necessarily agree with these tactics, right? They're too disruptive. They're too maybe messy. Um, they will support sort of the legal challenge aspect of it, but they don't support the boycott. And there's all sorts of tension between the NAACP and King during the boycott. And, um, and I, think, I think oftentimes we sort of, whatever that Monday morning quarterbacking of sort of we know where it's going. And so we assume that all good people were on board um, at the jump. Um, Right, UAW Walter Ruther doesn't approve of them bringing Rosa Parks to Detroit in 1956. I mean, the people, you know, it's messy. Just to share with people, you, you cited Gary Young, and I, I, uh, this quote also jumped out to me. That you, you start chapter eight with this Gary Young quote, white America came to embrace King in the same way that most white South Africans came to accept Nelson Mandela, grudgingly and gratefully, retrospectively, selectively, without grace, but with considerable guile. By the time they realized that their dislike of him was spent and futile, he had created a world in which admiring him was in their own self-interest because, in short, they had no choice. Gary Young is the most beautiful writer ever, right? Yes. I mean, it's such the word, yeah, yeah. And I mean, and, and well, and, and Gary Young, of course, born and and and, and raised in the UK, and right. and coming here, and then uh, doing some of the best reporting, uh, contemporary reporting about race in this country. Not to mention, I mean, Gary is an amazing reporter on everything he does, but su such an incredible, incisive analysis that he brings to the table. And I wonder if there's part of it that comes from entering from the outside, because he's, right. he's treated, when you watch him interacting, he did, there was this video recently where he interviews the neo-Nazi Richard Spencer. And, and, and if you see, I mean, Richard Spencer, I think, has no idea what to do with 
Gary Young, you know, and then the accent, right? That's what I mean. <laughs> Gary Young, he's, it's like he's got a British accent and yeah, he is exactly. black. What am I supposed to do with this? And it's he really looks frightened, like like something is wrong here. And it's beyond the fact that a black man who's educated is talking to Richard Spencer. Something is very wrong, and you know, mm -hmm. in in that situation, the um, uh, the story of Rosa Parks, and I heard the the applause for the rebellious life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. So I'm sure a lot of people here. Uh, have read that and are familiar with the history. What I found fasc you know, unbelievably fascinating about that story is how little of it ever trickled out into the way that she was sort of put on this pedestal for right. various people's own right. political uh, aims, including by people within the civil rights movement. Absolutely. She had an extraordinary life. I mean, you, you say it's a rebellious yeah. life. Given that we, you know, you've, you've covered this in your, in, in your previous book, um, but I still think it's worth sketching out for people this incredible journey that she was on while she was here with us in right. this world. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's just, it, I mean, she grows up in a family where her grandfather is a Garveyite. Her, one of her first political memories is staying out, like her grandfather right after World War I, right? There's this uptake of white violence after World War I, sort of seeking to put black soldiers back in their place. Um, and so her grandfather sits out at night with a shotgun. This is six-year-old Rosa Parks. She sits with him because she wants to see him shoot a Ku Kluxer. So she has a political spirit from the, from the get-go. She get, gets in trouble with her grandmother for sort of uh, pushing a white boy. Um, so they, you know, her grandmother's worried she's going to be killed. Rosa Parks said, I'd rather be lynched than not say I don't like it. Um, but kind of where her political life really starts is she meets and falls in love with Raymond Parks. Raymond Parks is working on the Scottsboro case when she meets him. This is 1931. Just very quickly for people that don't know the Scottsboro case. So I mean, yeah, Scottsboro, it's really stupid. Just quickly describe it. Yeah, nine, <laughs> um, nine young men are arrested for riding the rails in 1931 when they discover two young white women in a neighboring train car that charged turns to rape. And they're all, except the youngest, sentenced to death. And so a local movement grows in Alabama to protect and defend these young men from being um, executed. And one of the local activists working on that is Raymond Parks. And she describes him as the first real activist I ever met. And so it, it opens up this world for her. Um, and in the beginning, he's the more public activist and she's more behind the scenes. Now by the 1940s, she wants to be more active. She finds it galling that black people are being asked to serve in World War II, her brother's overseas, and, she, and yet can't register to vote at home. She wants to register to vote. Uh, she joins the NAACP. They're working on voter registration issues, but they're also working on issues that we would consider criminal justice issues. Two kinds of cases. One, like we've heard about recently with the Oprah speech, cases involving white, uh, white violence against black people, and in particular, white rape and sexual violence against black women. So they're working on a number of those cases. The second kind of case they're working on are what are Scottsboro kinds of cases, legal lynching cases, cases where black men are being wrongfully accused. Uh, one case that really bothers her and she works long and hard on is a case of a 16-year-old by the name of Jeremiah Reeves uh, who's having a relationship with a white young white woman. It gets found out. She cries rape, and he is ultimately executed. But they fight for years trying to prevent that. Um, now, recently, Rosa Parks' papers were opened, uh, a, a portion of them at the Library of Congress. And one of the things that really struck me about her papers is there is a small cache of personal writings that seem to come from the 1950s. And in those writings, she is talking over and over about how lonely it is, how hard it is, how hard it is to be a rebel, kind of the pressure not to dissent, how crazy she feels, how, how mentally kind of destabilizing racism is. And they're a real window both into like this long struggle even before she's going to make her bus stand in 1955 and how much they've been fighting and losing. I mean, basically, they mostly lose. So even though every kindergartner now learns that Rosa Parks was courageous, like part of what makes what she does on December 1st, 1955 so courageous is that she's done things like this before. Other people have done things mm -hmm. like this before. There's nothing to suggest that this is going to change anything. And there's a lot to suggest that she could get hurt or she could lose her job. Um, and so, I mean, that kind of courage, the courage of perseverance, the courage of being able to see an opportunity, even though there's nothing to suggest that opportunity will do something. And then, 
even after that, and even after they're forced to leave Montgomery eight months after the boycott ends, she gets fired during the boycott, her husband loses his job, um, they move to Detroit where her brother is, she'll spend the next 40 years fighting the racism of the Jim Crow North. She'll call it the Northern Promised Land that wasn't, um, and she'll just keep fighting. And she'll talk about Malcolm X as her personal hero. She'll, um, she, she, she's both active in the black power movement in Detroit and around the country. She's also an internationalist like King, so she's a very early opponent in the war in Vietnam. Um, she, in the 80s and the early CCR, she sits on a war crimes tribunal about US involvement in Central America. Um, uh, eight days after 9-11, she, Harry Belafonte, Danny Glover, a group of civil rights activists put out a statement calling on the United States, you know, no war, work within the international community, no retaliation, right? She is a, she's a badass, right? But that, that, that's been lost. And I think part of why we lose it is also that we expect badasses to come in one form, right? She is shy, right? She mm -hmm. is, you know, we can talk about, I mean, I talk about her as sort of a shy radical or a shy, you know, like a, you know that she's also middle-aged during, so during black power. You know, people talk about how she'd come to these really, you know, she'd come to these talks on reparations and she'd sit in the front row and she'd knit, right? I mean, or she'd send thank you notes to these, you know, she, Chokwe Lumumba told me this amazing story. Um, Chokwe Lumumba, people, um, he was in the RNA, then he, right before he died, he ran for mayor of Jackson, he became mayor of Jackson, his, his son now is now mayor of Jackson. So Chokwe told me this story, he was representing, he becomes a lawyer and he does all this great sort of legal justice work. And one of the things, he's, he's representing members of the RNA in the Brinks case. Um, they're being charged with conspiracy, they drag in a whole bunch of radicals um, around conspiracy charges and he says he gets home one night and there's a thank you note uh, you know this person says you know thank you for your work and for standing strong for your people and then he says the next day he goes and finds the note because he's thinking rosa rosa and it's like rosa parks in her 60s writing him a thank you note basically for doing this kind of you know <laughs> steadfast legal justice work um so she is these these this mix of things right and i think sometimes partly we miss it because we think it's going to come only in one one form right and and sometimes we miss it because you know i think um we've made these kind of divides between you know civil rights and black power, and I think sometimes we miss it because we don't go back to the people we think we know. And so uh, I think part of what this book is also trying to do is to kind of say, they've made Parks, the, the way that Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King have been honored has, has made them kind of unavailable for us today. And in some sense they're honored, but in other sense they're made kind of prissy and passive and kind of like taken out and sort of sepia-toned, right? They become uninteresting almost. And so to kind of return to these figures, which, and the book talks about all sorts of other people. So it's not just on King and Parks. And, uh, but I think there is a, there's a utility in going back to these figures we think we know. Right, and, and uh, you know, this may sound like, a, a, like there's something deeper behind this question, but I literally mean it in, in the most simple way. Mm -hmm. who, who is responsible for those narratives being crafted. I mean, is it just, was it, is it just sort of a, the snowballing uh, effect or like how did that happen and, and who would you identify as crafters of that or key moments when it happened? Right. Yeah. So I think there are kind of, I mean, so one of the key moments that I talk about in the book is the sort of struggle for the King holiday, right, which is a 15 year struggle. It begins almost as soon as King is assassinated. Conyers introduces the first bill. People like Coretta Scott King and Parks and many civil rights activists press for it for years and years and years and years. Reagan opposes it. He, he's worried about too many holidays. They're gonna to be too costly. Yeah. <laughs> he also can't rule out that King might be a communist and he says this multiple times. Um, but interestingly, Reagan, this is you know, 1982, 1983, he's facing kind of char you know, charges that he's not sensitive to racial issues, there's been some, um, and he's running for re-election. And so he starts to see a utility in changing his position on this. So, there's, so that's a crucial moment, I think, because when, you, when Reagan signs the legislation, 
the way that he talks about King, the way that it's about courageous individuals who freely sort of see an injustice and point it out and then we, it, we correct it. So it's like the United States, it's like I call it, the US is a self-cleaning oven, right? We're just constantly fixing ourselves. Um, and also this sort of idea that like in the rest of the world they couldn't do this, but here, right, mm -hmm. so this American exceptionalism. So I think on the one hand we start to see the political utility now that we're like, you know, at, of celebrating the civil rights movement as a way to put the struggle for racial justice in the past. Now part of that is in trying to press for the King holiday, what you see supporters do is they start to universalize King. Um, they start to talk about him in particular ways. Um, I think, so I think there, that's not, I mean, that's part of what happens, right, is how, you know, there's so little history that makes it through that, like, to sort of try to get that history through, we start to um, narrow kind of how we're going to talk about these figures. Um, also, the the kind of what is seen as honorable. So if you, how many people have gone to the King Memorial in Washington, right? It's, it's both so long overdue and there's something very moving about it because tons of people are there, tons of school groups come, but it is not, in, you know, it doesn't do justice to Dr. King in multiple ways. Um, if you've seen it, he towers above us, right? He's, he's made distant, he's made huge. Uh, the original sort of plans for the memorial had alcoves to honor other activists. Those get scrapped. Uh, but perhaps the worst thing is there's a kind of semicircle where there's like 14 quotes inscribed. Um, not one of those quotes uses the word race, racism, segregation, right? So we have a national memorial for Martin Luther King that does not speak about race. Um, <laughs> And so, and I, I mean, I, I think one of the things I heard was they, one of the quotes that was supposed to be there was the beginning of the Mar March on Washington speech where, as many of you may know, right, that I have a dream stuff comes at the end, but the beginning of the March on Washington speech, King is talking about how America gave black people a bad check and they're there to collect. Right, that's a whole different situation than dreaming, right? That's about <laughs> material redress. Um, and apparently that was one of the quotes that had originally been selected to go, to be on that wall and that was deemed too controversial. Um, they, so, I mean, I think, I think there are all sorts of things that go into this, but I think one of the most important is the kind of utility, the national utility that the civil rights movement comes to take on in terms of making us feel good about ourselves, making it sort of seem like it becomes a way to kind of celebrate American democracy, right? So if you look at sort of the ways that when they dedicate the Rosa Parks statue in, the stat in Statuary Hall, right? Mitch McConnell, John Boehner, they're like, what a great way to celebrate America, right? I mean, literally. This, it becomes the celebration of America, it becomes this way to say, look how special we are, but it also becomes a way to say, we did this, this was a problem, and we're done, basically done. Um, and so I think that, that strips, and then I think, um, I think, and this is the hardest thing, I, I think some of us, and I put myself here too, I mean, when I was doing the research for the Rosa Parks book, and this, the research in this book is kind of research I've done over the past 15 years that sort of encompasses a lot of different uh, research projects, is the ways that I think even those of us who think we know need to kind of remember that, there's, there, that this kind of miseducation goes deep. Um, and, and, um, and so I think, I mean, how I got to the Rosa Parks research was I was just doing a piece on kind of public memory of Rosa Parks, and in my head I was like, oh, I'm sure somebody's written a biography of her. I just need to go find it because I need to, like, put in this piece, like, some stuff about who she actually was. And then I'm like, oh, there's no actual footnoted biography of Rosa Parks. 
And then that's surprising to me. And then, but it takes me a couple more years to decide that really I should do that because because it didn't seem that cool, right? And I was, you know, my, most of my work up to that point was on the civil rights movement in the North, and then I'm just, it seems like the black freedom struggle in the North, and people would look at me in those years and be, I'd be like, I think I'm gonna do a biography of Rosa Parks, and they'd be like, oh, yes. I mean, colleagues, mm -hmm. people in the, you know, because I think sometimes we think we know, and Julian Bond said this to me when I was working on the book. He was like, you know, I met her so many times, I thought, you know, I knew all there was to know about, you know, like I thought I knew what I needed to know about her, right? And so I think that um, that humility, that sense that there is so much we don't know and there's so much that maybe um, we repeat that is not sort of the, you know, kind of a fuller, more expansive history. We're gonna open up to, uh to all of you if you wanna um, hop in. Uh, but just briefly before uh, we do that, I've, I've found it interesting uh, the, in the whole uh, discussion over this Devin Nunes memo and the, the surveillance and the fact that like 24 seven on Fox News now, it's they're railing against the surveillance state right. uh, in, the, in, in the United States. Um, but when you, it surveils you know, them. one of the, what's that? I said when it surveils right, when them. It's, right, right, yeah, exactly. Uh, they've discovered now a, the one case that they could find where a wealthy white man was subjected to that kind of surveillance. But, um, uh, but they make statements like Tucker Carlson uh, said something like, you know, for the first time now, Americans have evidence that the surveillance powers have been used to target American citizens. For the first As time. A, have you heard of Martin Luther King okay, or yeah, Malcolm X? Or, I mean, you can go back right. for, you know, for, forever. The, and maybe this is a good way, to, a good note to end on before we, we, we start the uh, broader dis community discussion here. Give an overview of the kinds of tactics that were used against various sectors of the civil rights movement. Not, I mean, we, you know, there's there's the big pic, you know, the, the bigger figures like Martin Luther King, right. and, and and we know, you know, we know a great bit about the. I don't think we know even, you know, the, you know, anywhere near to the full extent of it. But we know a good bit about what what J. Edgar Hoover was doing, trying to get hit, telling him he should kill himself, threatening to black, you know, blackmailing him over the Nobel Peace Prize. But the FBI and other entities and and the targeting of the civil rights movement. I mean, I think there are kind of two different aspects of the targeting of the civil rights movement that are kind of important to look at. Um, the first is the kind of surveillance, monitoring, targeting, developing informants. Um, you know, by the, if people haven't read uh, Betty Medzger's The Burglary, um, which is about the break in it, um, the, the activists who break in in media Pennsylvania and kind of what they find. Um, and one of the things that they find is the FBI by the late 60s is developing informants and requiring agents to develop informants in every you know, black student association, right? They are, I mean, there's a kind of constant monitoring. Uh, people got all up in arms. Um, with Ava DuVernay's Selma because they show because it showed jo uh, Johnson being in cahoots with Hoover, except that we know that Johnson was in cahoots with Hoover around the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party uh, in 1964, and Johnson doesn't like the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party's challenge. Uh, they're going to bring a challenge at the Democratic Convention in 1964, saying the Mississippi Democratic Party excludes black people. They're trying to get seated. Johnson orders Hoover to surveil the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Um, they're getting real-time information. They're feeding real-time information to people like Bill Moyers. I mean, this, so, so I think there's a couple of well, things. Yeah, Bill Moyers learn. was the press secretary at the time, yeah? Yeah, yeah and they're yeah. like, so it's, I mean, so I think there's a couple of things that are important to see there. One, it's not J. Edgar Hoover as some sort of renegade jerk, right? And I think sometimes it becomes just personified <laughs> yeah. in him, right? And he does, he is sort of obsessed with Martin Luther King, but it's much broader than him. It has support. If you look at the memo where they decide to wiretap and bug King, which is signed right after the March on Washington, because that's when it really scares the Kennedys, Robert Kennedy's signatures on that, right? This is not a renegade operation. Um, but the other thing that I think is important to see is the ways that the FBI also does not concern itself with violence against civil rights activists. Hmm. Um, so they both are monitoring and targeting, but they're also standing aside 
when real violence is happening. So they're constantly chronicling it. They notice. Um, so the memos around the Montgomery bus boycott, right? King's house gets bombed. Uh, many leaders' houses get bombed. Churches get bombed. And they're noting that this is happening, but they see and they, you know, they note that the local police have no suspects, and then it's just like, carry on. Um, well, I mean, I look, I mean, more recently in Charlottesville, you, you had this young man, DeAndre Harris, who was beaten almost to death, and, uh, and it turns out that the location, he was beaten in a parking uh, garage by a white mob with uh, pipes and sticks, and uh, just recently, it was the parking garage of the Charlottesville Police Department, where he was beaten, and I feel like that's that hasn't been, yeah, no, yes, yeah, of course, yes, and and some yeah, and citizen activists caught it on on video, but it's it, just thinking about what you're saying, it's like, it happened in their in the garage in of watch. the police department, right, yeah, right, and so I think sort of thinking about both of those, right, the kind of wholesale surveillance and targeting, and the developing of informants, and wanting kind of endless information and. Apparently, by the late 60s, agents would have to like basically explain why they didn't have a black, like an informant working for them, even if they were working in an all-white place. Um, and I think, to me, that really resonates because, um, because I think we're seeing these parallels with the ways that Muslim students and Muslim groups and organizations are being surveilled today. And, and I think we don't take the right lessons. Um, so I think uh, I've... I've so one of the things that just <laughs> drove me over the edge, so James Comey, who now some people see as a hero, um, <laughs> he is- They're gonna put his monument right next to Dr. Dr. King's. Dr. King's, yeah. Right? He, he, he could take over one of the old alcoves. He that decided that what should happen is FBI agents now should have to take a, have a visit to the King Memorial, and then they each pick a favorite quote, and they discuss amongst themselves. Um, and he, you know, because he wants people to think about the, you know, how power can be abused. Um, and first, it's not at all clear to me how taking one of the quotes from the King Memorial at all gets us to how power can be abused. Because I think the the, the difficulty, the trickiness there is actually to sort of think about who you're surveilling today and how that might be an abuse of power, not how much you love Dr. King and this statement he made about peace in 1955, right? Because I think it actually works in exactly the opposite way, which is you read this thing by Dr. King and you feel good that you would never have surveilled Dr. King, but the people you are surveilling, it's urgent, they're extreme, Right, this, the same kind, you know, the kind of language they use against King, they use now, but somehow now these are the real extremists, these are the real demagogues. Um, mm. And so, you know, I think there's this, again, this is another place where there's both supposedly this awareness of how we went astray, and yet the ways that we grapple with going astray, I think, just leads to sort of a further distance between the tactics we use today and then feeling bad about the tactics we used 50 years ago. And of course, now we have you know this discussion of the of this term that the that they're using now, the black identity, identity. extremists, um, and maybe someone was going to ask a question about that. Uh, this is an incredible book, and one of the, what I one of the things I adore about this book is that you clearly wrote it for the normies, and and it's not it's not written for uh, for sort of an elite group of people. That this this book is totally accessible, which is awesome coming from such an esteemed academic to write uh, a book that I can read. Uh, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll open, open it up now for um, preferably questions. If you have a comment, try to make it brief if it's something you want Jean to respond to. Um, but we'll, we'll just go side to side. Yes, over here. We, we have a microphone coming your way. Your mi a mic is coming your way. So, um, so thank you. Um, so, uh, you just gave me an opening because you mentioned Betty Metzger's book. Right. And I, would, I wonder if you could talk about some of what you've been talking about, about liberalism and um, criminalizing people who are more radical right. in terms of the standpoint of building a movement. Because the other thing I'm struck by when we talk about COINTELPRO, or when you mentioned Shokwe, who's representing, represented Matulu Shakur, who's still in prison, is that COINTELPRO also had a plan to divide the black movement so that the, quote, respectable and the unrespectable, the unrespectable being the Panthers, 
um, would be divided, and I think that had an impact. And that's what I want to ask you about in terms of the work that you've done in support of the Muslim uh, prisoners, but also in terms of the fact that there are still black political prisoners because the movement didn't support people who took more radical turns. Right. I mean, I think one of the things that I, when I was doing the research for the book that I was thinking about a lot is this kind of mythology that truth just comes to light. That somehow we're just fine, if the, if the people are doing bad things, we'll just find out about them, right? And I think one of the things about the 19th, the, the break-in in media Pennsylvania is this stuff didn't come to light until people actually did that, right? Nobody, and that if we talk about the surveillance of Martin Luther King, and this is to me a very humbling thing, so Hoover goes around and he, sh he tries to shop this salacious information about King to lots of reporters. And interestingly, unlike probably today, the reporters don't take it. But they also do not report on the fact that the FBI is shopping around salacious information on, on Martin Luther King. So it's not like there wasn't the possibility to sort of have tried to um, break open this story. Uh, in terms of the break in, it, in the, the media files, the, the activists that, that break into the, the office and they, they copy all these files and they send them to the Washington Post, the New York Times, the LA Times, and the New York Times and the LA Times dutifully return them. Right? Um, and then when the Washington Post courageously forges forth, then the next day the New York Times covers it. Um, but I think, I think, Part of what's humbling about this history is that truth doesn't sort of just naturally come to light. I think part of what's humbling about this history is that it's really hard to do the right thing, um, and mostly people don't. Um, and it's, it takes a lot of, you know, fortitude. Uh, and, and so, and, and, and we prefer narratives where, where it just gets wrapped up, right? That there's, a, there's like this problem has been and done, right? Which I think then is complicated by the fact that there are people who were arrested in 68 or 72 who are still in prison, right? That, is a, that complicates that narrative of like, we're done with this era. Um, and, and I think, I think one of the, I should say, one, I think one of the dangers coming up on the 50th anniversary of the King assassination is the ways that I'm, I fear we're going to sort of stop it with that tr tragedy and, and make it seem like that was the end of, of the black freedom struggle and, and miss kind of the ways it continues on and all the people who continued it on, uh, including uh, Coretta Scott King. Anyone on this side? Interesting. Yeah, sir, over here, this, uh, this gentleman back there, yeah, with, with this, yeah. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you later. to speak up and, and brown people, but part of the movement I know, we're going to need you. We're going to need you, Jeremy. We're going to need you, Gene. So how can we get folks to, to just be honest and speak out? Because I think a lot of black people uh, fear uh, speaking out. They may lose their jobs. They may lose, who knows? But I, I don't know if you, s some white people have that same uh, fear. So how can we get that to happen? Because I think that will help the civil rights for everybody. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> Would you like to? I, look, I mean, I, one of the, I, I, I appreciate uh, your sentiments there. Um, I, you know, I, I, uh, I didn't go to college, 
and, um, and sort of grew up in, a, in an unorthodox uh, way. And um, you know, early on in my adult life, um, I, I sort of came to the conclusion that when, if you are white in this country, uh, you are always going to spend your life, if you're a person of conscience or you care, uh, as a recovering racist. Um, and I think, now some people may disagree with that characterization, uh, but I, I, I think even the most woke people, you know, uh, around that are white, if they're not in touch with the privileges they uh, are given just by nature of who they are, uh, then there's a, a limit to how far they can go with uh, being an ally or being in solidarity or joining in that struggle. And you know, one of the most important things I think Gene said tonight, uh, you know, is is uh, has to do with listening to the people who are on the front lines and, and what do they need uh, to, to strengthen the position or to hold the line. And I think a lot of white people fail at doing that. They'll come in and they say, well, let me tell you how it's, how it's done. And, and I think that there are a lot of very serious problems historically in this country with the largely white anti-war movement. And I, I, I've been to so many meetings where people are like, well, well, black people don't come to these meetings. And I'm like, well, what's your position on, on prisons in this country right now? What's the, the on for-profit prisons, on police killings, on any, you can't expect somebody to just, they don't come to you, you come to them and say, we, we're listening to you. We're not trying to say you need to be part of our uh, march against the war. You need to, to, to connect the dots yourself. So for me, I always feel like, you know, as a white person in, the, in this society, when asked a question like that, you have to start from a position of absolute humility about who you are in this society. And if you recognize that and you own it, it's the same way as battling against a, a, an addiction to a substance. When you, when, you, when you sort of name it and you own it, then it liberates you to say, I'm, I'm willing to listen to uh, anyone who's a person of struggle and figure out how I can plug into it. I've got a question. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Clinton Dyer. Um, I'm Brooklyn born and bred. Um, I would like you to discuss uh, a topic that really hits home. Um, the similarities between ethnic cleansing and the gentrification happening in Brooklyn. Mm. Mm -hmm. um. So, and I think one of the places to begin that is to kind of take us kind of, and again, I'm an historian, so I always want to take us back to history, but I think sometimes seeing that this has a much longer history um, of how kind of the politics of space in this city have worked, right, and who's profited from that. Uh, and so I think we can't have a conversation about gentrification bef without having a conversation about this kind of long history of housing segregation um, and of using, right, one of the ways that segregation in, in places like New York um, was excused is this was with kind of culture of poverty kinds of explanations that the reason that these neighborhoods are not good, do not, are not being invested in is because the people in those neighborhoods don't know how to keep those neighborhoods up. And the people in those neighborhoods don't care about education and so that's why their kids aren't doing well in school. And those explanations reign supreme. They sometimes, I mean they continue to reign supreme. And so then, when those neighborhoods then become appealing, then become proximate to the places that people are work, become, you know, lo and behold, are proximate to the subway, um, that there, that if the assumption is that certain kind of cultural values are superior and certain kind of cultural values need to be improved, right? I think that's where. Um, so to me, I'm not sure I would use the metaphor of ethnic cleansing. I, I think I would talk about kind of this, 
uh, way that racism is cloaked in this kind of culture of poverty idea where then people feel justified, like I'm uplifting this neighborhood, I'm bringing, you know, and then the coffee shops follow me. Um, and not taking responsibility both for the ways that people profit both off of segregation and off of gentrification um, and the kind of very material sort of benefits that, that many people in the city have gained from the system of segregation that then has produced this like new reality of gentrification. I mean, there was a piece recently, or not, not so recently, maybe it was a, a year or two ago in the New York Times uh, on the issue of, uh, of, uh, that you're raising but totally missing the point. It was sort of like, where's the next hot place for developers? And, and I, was, I was struck by the quote of one of the, the, the kind of vultures that's coming in uh, saying like, East New York is already done. Like me, meaning that they've already gone door to door and they've convinced people to sell very low and then they're, they're on to the next neighborhood. And you know, I think if you, I'm, I'm, I'm from the Midwest, I'm from Milwaukee, which is if not the most, one of the most segregated cities in the, in the country and it has the most uh, incarcerated area code, 53206. Uh, and in Chicago you had uh, you know, the, the erection of these huge housing projects that they were named like Ida B. Wells and, and uh, uh, Caprini Green and, and um, Robert Taylor Homes. Uh, there, there was actually a plan put in place that was, uh, that was aimed at these buildings that would go straight, straight up into the sky rather than spreading across land that was also linked to, uh, Mersa Baradaran has a great book about uh, the, the targeting of, uh, of black banks and the way that black banks were created. Um, but in this city, I, 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 I think that there are a tremendous uh, amount of white people that uh, are so unbelievably ignorant of what they are doing when they come into certain neighborhoods that it causes this tension that you can cut with a knife in the air. And, um, you know, and I, I think part of it is on the way that our local elected officials uh, handle these issues. Um, but again, part of it has to be, if you're gonna move into a neighborhood, uh, you have to ask, what am I bringing to this neighborhood? Uh, and it doesn't mean like, what do I think I should bring to this neighborhood? It's like, are you going to be a part of that community or are you there as a settler, you know, who's, who's planting a flag? And, and, and that's a much deeper conversation that we, that we should have. But for now, I think we, we can maybe take one more uh, question or comment and we'll let Jean wrap it up there. Uh, is there anyone that, didn't get to say something that, one, oh, somebody already has the mic. I couldn't see you behind the pole. Yeah, go ahead, sir. So I also want to say thank you for writing a book about um, um, racism. That's awesome. And I do feel that, you know, you, white people taking a stand on racism, bringing light to it, it's like the most moving thing that this country needs, and especially this, um, this, this neighborhood, especially Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. But my question is, um, we touched a lot about separation and segregation, mm -hmm. but we never really touched on the actual laws that were put in place, like the Jim Crow laws. Mm -hmm. So I always feel like it always starts from the top. Mm -hmm. um, what, is, what is your, what is your, you know, your perspective on the laws that were put in place to separate us right. and to kind of put us in an oppressive state, mm -hmm. hence why we, you know, we come combat and we, we, we reform. So just give us, well, give me your take on, on the Grim, Jim Crow laws. Right, and I think when we talk about Jim Crow laws, we often t focus on laws in the South that specifically delineated black and white people can't go to school together or we need to have separate Bibles in the courtroom or penitentiaries. But what I would include also in Jim Crow laws are school zoning, right? School zoning lines are not made naturally. They don't come from God. They come from political officials. They are official lines. And when you look at the ways that school zoning lines are drawn, and when you look at the ways that school zoning lines were drawn in the 50s, in the 60s, what you see is school officials constantly adjusting those lines to maintain the sort of racial makeup of the schools as they were, 
Um, and so I guess what I would ask us to do is to sort of think about Jim Crow laws not just in terms of the South, but also in terms of a place like New York City. And that's why somebody like Ella Baker, um, who is on that subcommittee, who is organizing parents in New York in the 1950s, is focusing in on zoning. She's focusing in on where teachers are placed, right? Because these are official state decisions, right? These are policies, these are laws. And to sort of understand those as being maybe not exactly the same as, but similar in terms of state action as Southern Jim Crow laws and therefore sort of falling under the mandate of Brown. Um, and we will see judges by the 1970s as you take school systems like Boston and LA to court say that very same thing, right? That LA is, re is drawing its zoning lines to keep schools segregated. Boston is doing the same. Boston is busing kids before 1974 to maintain segregated schools. So, so I guess where I would like us to sort of, uh, what I would like us to sort of see is a kind of, the ways that we've talked typically about Jim Crow is it focus on particular kinds of laws in the South and, and kind of misses the sort of laws in the North. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Jean, I just want to give you a brief moment to, to wrap everything up. Uh, and, and, uh, and Jean, of course, is going to um, sign books here. Uh, my understanding is going to take place uh, here. Uh, I had promised at the beginning that I was, I, I was going to give you an opportunity to talk about um, struggling for your students, but it's, you're one of three or four uh, professors that I've, I've met who uh, have taken such an incredible position in defense of their students when, uh, when the, the, the target sites are, are on them, and I, I have endless respect for that um, uh, because it's, I think it's unfortunately rare. Um, but uh, I would love for you to share with people just a, a brief bit about the, the battle against Islamophobia, the targeting of, uh, of your students, um, and, and sort of how you see your role in the lives of students when they, when they come under attack. Right. Um, so I guess, I guess a couple of things. Um, I mean, what, do we, what we've been talking about tonight is how difficult it is, right, the kinds of blinders we have, the kinds of ways that we the frames that we get to seeing things. And so this, about 10 years ago, um, a student of mine was arrested on material support to terrorism charges uh, and charged in the federal system. And like all you know, good progressives, I thought I was paying attention and I had been following the evils of Guantanamo and I, I had sort of come to believe that I understood the way this war on terror was working and it was about creating these extra legal sites, right? These offshore sites where they could do bad things. And I was not paying so much attention to the criminal justice system. And I think what happened to me when he got arrested was, um, was having to see both, and again, echoing this point I've been trying to make tonight about how sort of all of us have to kind of humble ourselves to the things we don't know um, and to the assumptions we make that might sort of not actually reflect what's happening. And so as I came to kind of look deeper, and, and this case seems scary, it was on the headlines and he's like an Al Qaeda quartermaster and it seemed scary and, um, and then you look deeper, right, and many of the things that I study, right, in the civil rights movement in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, um, in terms of the criminalization of people speaking out, in terms of the kind of fear um, of kind of ideas, right, and, and sort of radical ideas. Um, so this young man had been surveilled while he was a student at Brooklyn College. He, ha he, hold, he held and holds, you know, very outside of the mainstream ideas. He was extremely critical of the United States, called the United States a terrorist organization. Um, and so this led me to both realize how much more I needed to know in terms of what was happening domestically and in the federal system vis-a-vis -vis sort of terrorism cases ha being handled domestically, not the ones um, coming through Guantanamo but also kind of what it meant to have to sort of 
speak out on something that was so scary and that at this point, and this was again about 10 years ago, like almost no one was writing about it at all, right? And I remember just the first time I wrote about it, I mean, and, and it continued just to be, you know, it's, it was so scary. Um, and, it, and you feel crazy and you feel, and so I think part of the reading of Rosa Parks' writings from the 1950s and how insane she, and she keeps talking about feeling insane, right? And feeling like, you know, crazy and alone and, and that sort of feeling of like, how do I know that this is really an injustice? And how do I know that like, um, so I, I wrote about it and, and, and more people came to see this injustice. Uh, and then, and, I, and I, so I've done a lot of work around kind of what's happening within the sort of federal system, vis, you know, vis-a-vis -vis these terrorism prosecutions. Um, and my students and I have been doing a lot of work around surveillance and the AP breaks those stories about all the surveillance of the NYPD is. Um, Partnership with the CIA mm -hmm. and then spying mm -hmm. on Muslim businesses mm -hmm. and students. And, yeah. But again, it was, a, it was sort of a teleological story and it was like the, right. the, you know, the AP guys were the good guys because they, they spent all this time and they brought this story to light and then there, there was these changes, right? And this is a little bit the narrative that, you know, of like, that this city has bought, right? Which is that that year the AP exposes it and then de Blasio runs and then we're done. And, um, <laughs> and we discovered last year that the NYPD had embedded an undercover officer basically in this period since the discovery of the AP through 2015 to spy on predominantly sort of Muslim women students, um, but also political students. Um, and because at, at Brooklyn College, at Brooklyn College, um, but because again, there was this idea of well, the AP had broke that story and, and they'd brought it to light, and there had been reform, and we got De Blasio. It was extremely hard to sort of get people to pay attention to it and to take it seriously, um, and to take seriously the harms of that, um, and and and. And my students very much felt like they weren't going to be listened to, and so they, and I, this is where I, this is my pitch for The Intercept, um, they asked me to write a piece talking about the harms of the surveillance on them, um, which I did, and, um, and The Intercept published. Uh, many places did not want to publish that, um, but thankfully, the inter and I think it, and I heard from lots of people and around the country of what it meant to see documented in a national news source, right, the harms of surveillance on Muslim young people. And what it and how crazy it makes you feel and how much you start surveilling yourself and changing yourself. And so I think um, but I guess I don't know. I don't know how to end because I think this is sort of a sad way to end. Um, and I guess maybe I'll end with sort of talking about the title of the book. Um, because <laughs> That's not, um, the title is taken from a James Baldwin. Uh, you notice piece. that Jean left herself completely out of that story. I mean, it, it's, when I, the first time I met Jean was at an event at the Center for Constitutional Rights, and she came up to me and didn't even introduce herself and had g grabbed me to talk to the brother of her student uh, because all she cared about that night was talking to all these people at this big reception mm -hmm. about the fate of her student and she had come there knowing there's going to be all these lawyers and journalists and it's like th this is a tireless advocate for her students in addition to being a great academic and, and writer. Thank you. Um, so uh, in order to end on a happy note or more happier, um, so part of why I chose this title um, so it's from Baldwin. It's from his talk to teachers. This, like, his quote is, um, uh, American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. Um, and part of why I called it a more beautiful and terrible history is because I think on the one hand it is more sobering. It is more terrible. It, it makes us face much more uncomfortable questions. But I also think it's more beautiful. It offers us more in terms of where we go from here. Um, it offers us more. It, I mean, the courage is even more astonishing. Um, I mean, I, and I, I began this, like even with when I was doing the Rosa Parks book of, she only gets better, right? This bigger story, this more expansive story, this wider story. 
right? It's, it's even more impressive and it gives us even more for today. Um, and so I guess that's where I want to end because I think, and that's how I got myself out of this cul-de-sac a year ago of like, do we need this book? And <laughs> here we are, we have Trump and now we get, you know, there's like this criticism maybe is not what we need today. And then realizing how much this does give us um, in terms of where we go from here and the struggle ahead. Let's give it up for Jean Theo Harris. Amazing. Get the book in the back there and then come around and Jean will sign your book. <laughs>